Let us pray. Holy Spirit, as the scripture is read, open our hearts and minds to hear the truth. Shine light where we cling to darkness, convict where there is need, and lead us to respond to your word with passion and joy. Amen. Today's first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, 12 and 13a, and 19 through 21. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of, some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, my brothers, listen to me. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At this time, we'll be passing out the friendship folders. Please fill them out. Let us know that you've been here. And if you'd like to give us any information, just write on there to us. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, there are prayer cards in there. And fill it out and put it in the offering plate for uh, our prayer team to deal with uh, at another time later this week. And uh, could we have all the children in the room come on down for our message for growing Christians, which is being led by Lou Ann Sims.
Good morning, everyone. I didn't know there were so many of you here. I'm excited to see all of you. How many of you have been coming to church the last several weeks? Can you raise your hand? Nobody? I, some of you I've seen here. <laughs> My friend Miss Kelly and I have been doing some really special announcements for Vacation Bible School every week. Has anybody been here early enough to see those? Do you remember what they were about? Kate, a little bit? Well, I'll tell you what. I thought that maybe you wouldn't remember. Maybe some of you haven't been here because you've been traveling or things. So I'm going to give you a little review of what Miss Kelly and I have been talking about for Vacation Bible School the last few weeks. And I have some people here to help me do this reenactment of what's been happening. So I'm just going to go... I'm just going to go wait in this phone booth I have over here while you guys have this review lesson. Hi, I'm Miss Kelly. <laughs> Our theme for Vacation Bible School this year is superheroes. I'm dressed like a superhero. But... Luann over there doesn't understand what a superhero is. Yes, yes I do. I'm a gorilla and they're really strong like superheroes. So. A gorilla's not a superhero. <laughs> now I'm a banana. How about that? <laughs> no, a banana's not a superhero. Banana's not a superhero either. Right. I put on a cape, now I'm a superhero. No. <laughs> Wearing a cape does not make you a superhero. You have to be brave, you have to be strong, you have to be willing to do the right thing to help people in need. Now I'm a dad. A dad's a real superhero. <laughs> well... Well, uh, okay, yeah, yes, dads are superheroes. <laughs> dads, dads are superheroes, kind of, but that's not really what we're going for here. This is a crisis. Vacation Bible School is only three weeks away, and Luann still doesn't know what a superhero is. We need someone to come and help, or we're going to have a big, big problem. My special superhero power is having fun with Miss Kelly and sometimes giving her a hard time. She's so gullible. Of course I know what a superhero is. Miss Kelly is one of my very good friends, and I met her right here at Westchester United Methodist Church. And one of the ways that I got to know her is by working at Vacation Bible School with her as a volunteer. And now she's one of my very, very good friends. And I even spend time with her outside of church. We go to the gym together, we go to the movies together, and one time on a bus trip, I took a picture of her sleeping with her mouth open and drool running down her face. <laughs> Friends are one of the greatest gifts that God gives us. And if you come to Vacation Bible School, you'll make friends too, with other kids in your group and with some of the adults who are volunteering. You'll laugh with them, you'll sing with them, you'll dance with them, you'll pray with them, you'll worship with them, and they will be part of your life and your church family forever and ever. And if you have friends who don't already have a church family, or don't have lots of friends, or just need something to do, or someone that you like, invite them to come to Vacation Bible School too, so they can make new friends and, have, and maybe become part of our church family. That's how many, many of our people here today have become part of our family here through Vacation Bible School. So, one thing that I would like you to do, I think I know what your superhero power is as I look at you. It's looking cute, isn't it? <laughs> I can tell. So what I'd like you to do is look out at the congregation and look as cute as you possibly can. 
Go ahead, cuter. <laughs> cuter, okay. That's pretty cute. But now, imagine if we didn't have enough volunteers to help with Vacation Bible School. How sad would you look? Can you show the congregation how sad you would look? That's awfully cute, but awfully sad. So please don't let this happen. Grown-ups, if you've never volunteered for Vacation Bible School before, think about it. We can use you in whatever capacity you're comfortable working in. Boys and girls, let's close with a prayer. Can we close our eyes and bow our heads? Dear God, thank you for giving us one of your greatest gifts, which is the friendship and fellowships that you provide for us here at this church and everywhere. We hope that you'll bring us many, many children to Vacation Bible School this year and many helpers so that we can have a very successful event. Amen. Splash room. So if you're eligible for the splash room, you can follow Miss Judy there. Otherwise, you can go back and sit with your family. Thank you.
The second reading is from Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to ask that you remain seated for this next song. Why don't we just stay seated? And we're going to sing through twice, Spirit of the Living God. Steve will play through. Um, we'll sing with the organ first. And then we'll sing a cappella the second time. And uh, sing it as a prayer to ask the Spirit to come and strengthen us and guide us. Linda and Jerry, why don't you come and sit on the side up here so you're ready to rock and roll when it's time for you to speak up front here. And um, I'd like to mention this morning about how the church was born and how it grew. I mean, the church really began. Yes, there were people of faith throughout the, the time of the Old Testament, as we see, who knew God and loved God. But the church of Jesus Christ began when Jesus was sent, when Jesus came. He was the foundation for the church. His life his death, his resurrection, his teachings, his inspiration, the forgiveness that he brought. That's how the church began. And right after Christ died and went back to God the Father, then came the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which empowered, which gave vision, which sent the church off on a mission. And the third piece of building the church is mission. It's mission. The church went out on the mission field and it discovered who it is, that discovered who God is as they interacted with the people. Think about it. There was no theology of what it means to be a Christian until Peter and Paul went out there. And so did all the helpers with Peter and Paul. And right off the bat, the first thing they noticed was, what do we do with all these Gentiles that want to follow Jesus Christ? They heard the message of Jesus and they were inspired and they felt God's forgiveness. They began to be moved by the Spirit of God to have vision and to have power and to have insight. What do you do with the Gentiles? And there in the mission field, they had to craft what you do. Do they have to become Jews? Do they have to get circumcised? That'd be a painful way to become a Christian. You know, on the Sundays when we have new members come up, we'll have a circumcision up front for all those men. <laughs> Never been circumcised before? Yeah, then you can uh, become a Christian and be part of our church after that. No. That's not the conclusion that was drawn on how they did that. Whether, whether Gentiles at all should become part of the church. You know, that's what Peter had to deal with, with that dream with Cornelius and Peter, and how God said, no, wait a minute. It's not just the people of God that know Jehovah you know, that are acceptable, but everybody who wants to come and follow are acceptable in God's eyes. Uh, eating meat offered to idols. 
That was a problem that they discovered while they were out there. What do you do with all the idols out there? What do you do with people selling idols in the marketplace? Where do you draw the lines and the boundaries? It all happened in the mission field. It's in the mission field that the church came to know who they are and what God was calling them to be. And that's why mission is still so vitally important for us today. Why do we do mission trips every year that take us out to other places, whether it's here in the United States or out to other nations in the world? Why do we do that? To get to know what God is doing in them, in us, together, through us. Um, I haven't been on a mission trip with youth the whole time I was here in Westchester. It's been 12 years, right? And uh, I've been to Kenya six times, so I figured that was my mission experience, and it's been good, but that's, we, we've done what we needed to do in Kenya, it's run its course, so I decided this year to go to Haiti. And what I found in Haiti is, very much like I saw in Kenya, except much more intense and much more widespread. I mean, people living in abject poverty, and at least in Kenya, they had an economy going in their nation that there's hope that it will begin to keep spinning forward. Every, every year, the, Haitian, or the Kenyan economy increases 10 to 13%, which does spread across to all the people at some point, but not in Haiti. Haiti has kind of nothing going for it right now. It has no businesses. It has no big infrastructure. Um, some of the products that they produce through Mission of Hope, they can't even get fair trade tags on them because to get a fair trade tag, you need 90% of your product to come from that nation. Well, they don't have a fabric maker in all of Haiti. So whenever they make a, a pocketbook and send it up to the United States for sale, you can't put that fair trade label on it because 90% of that product did not come from Haiti and it's not gonna be able to do it. Um, basically, our team of 22 people came back with lots of stories, lots of stories. And a lot of them are away today because they've been away for a week and they wanted to get away for the 4th of July and that's good. But a few of us are here today and you'll see the rest of us here throughout the summer get a chance, go up and talk and ask for what kind of experiences people had. You can talk to Jerry and to Linda following the service to hear a little bit more about their experiences. But for me, the two main things I came away with, and, and you do spend time with Mission of Hope, going out into the villages and just talking, talking about faith, talking about issues that are important. Oh, talk to Corey as well, duh. Corey was there on the trip, absolutely. And he has lots of stories to share. The, the two main things I heard were, you know, what, I want to have a better life. I want to have a better life. There are people with college educations that get down in Haiti and then they have to move back into their shack in their neighborhood that has no water, uh, just dry dirt roads because there are no jobs. And one person asked, we pray with them to just have a better life, have some opportunities. And that's what we need to do, of course. Um, the second kind of piece that I, I came away with from Haiti was the big theological questions. I mean, I, I had somebody on our team, I'm not going to say who, but somebody on our team uh, on one of our last nights said, you know, all these years I've been thinking God takes care of everybody. God takes care of everybody, and God loves the poor. So why are these poor people starving to death? Where is God taking care of them? That's the kind of deep theology that you wrestle with in the mission field. An easy answer? No. Yeah, you can throw out a, a one-sentence answer about, you know, free will or whatever, but no. This is a deep question that takes a deep response over a long period of time. So I want you to think about that. Throughout this service, why isn't God taking care of people in Haiti? Or how is God taking care in people of Haiti? And what might you be called to do to help someone who is poor or a widow or an orphan? Because maybe you're a part of a long-term answer. Maybe our church is part of a long-term answer. This morning we have two people from our mission team that said they'd like to give just a brief moment uh, on Haiti. Uh, Linda Milliken, she's a senior in high school this year. Is that right, Linda? Is that... <laughs> no, I'm a graduate student. Oh, she's a grad student. That's good. Linda came on her first mission trip with the youth here at Westchester. Uh, just decided she wanted to do it. She'll tell her story. And um, she worked right alongside of everybody, hauling the concrete and the, well, I don't know about the concrete, uh, but definitely the cinder blocks and the big stones. So um, Linda has a word to say. Come on up, Linda. Can we have a hand for Linda Milliken? Thank you, Truman. Good morning. I might as well cry and get it over with. Um, why did I go to Haiti? And what was our church group doing there? I went to Haiti because I had um, some medical tests done 
and they came back okay. I wanted to give back. Jim said, I didn't have to go to Haiti to do that, <laughs> which is true, but I felt God calling me. Our church was there continuing work that was begun on prior trips in the village of Williamson. Members of United Methodist raised thousands of dollars so that we could build a house for a family and construct benches, pardon me, benches for a church. God worked through us on these tasks. I'd like to acknowledge those who contributed in any way to make this mission possible. Please raise your hand if you buy coffee or donuts from the youth. <laughs> Come on, I saw a couple of you having a donut. <laughs> if you helped with Wednesday night dinner, if you marked your collection envelope for the Haiti trip, or gave a donation, either through any Sunday school class, United Methodist Women, or otherwise, or any other way that you helped. Truman. <laughs> you were a part of this mission. Thank you, and, and God bless you. On construction days, we formed an assembly line and moved piles of rocks. I mean rocks. Yeah, rocks and stones, but real rocks. <laughs> I don't know what an unreal rock is, but I, I don't know. I didn't write that. Um, and we moved cement blocks for the, to the site of the house. Many of us mixed cement and carried buckets of cement and water to the workers. One little girl motioned to me to show her my guns, <laughs> and I did. And, and then she grabbed this flesh down. <laughs> Very few of them have, have that going on. <laughs> At the church, we planed boards that the carpenter measured, and, and he cut them. Then we sanded them to varnish for benches. All work was done at the sites by hand. The carpenter had, um, not a band saw, what? Thank you. Circular saw, but that was the only item that I um, remember. The real beauty of our helping was that the Haitian people, the natives, were in charge at all times. They were the masoners and the carpenters. We didn't go in and take over. We worked at their direction, and we helped them. That was really special. In addition, as Truman alluded to, we went into the homes of the villages to build relationships with them and share the gospel. At first, I was, um, un well, to be honest, I was uncomfortable with that, but then it became more easy as hearts opened. Our local interpreters and village leaders were excellent in assisting us. God was working through them, too. Memorable, me, memorable moments for me include when the youth of our church, whose trip this was, made sure I stood in shaded areas working on construction, and, and they really looked after me knowing that I'm soon to be 70. <laughs> um, and I didn't know most of them before we went. Another example is when the village lady into whose house we went 
accepted Christ as her Savior, and we all laid hands on her and prayed. When I taught several children how to play Simon Says, and they laughed and giggled when they made a mistake, and when I had a six-year-old deaf girl, and she looked into my eyes and smiled from ear to ear. When I trudged really slowly up the village hill, and a little boy came up behind me and pushed me on my butt <laughs> to move me faster. <laughs> and then the interpreter, I, I think he said, it's OK, she's just really old. <laughs> But I, I did walk a little faster. <laughs> and when I offered my water bottle to the carpenter who had the circular saw, he had no water or anything to drink all day. In conclusion, I'd like to read two Bible passages which are the epitome of the mission of hope for Haiti. The first one is from Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, and the second is from James chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. Afterward, would you please join me in prayer from Matthew. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. from James. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know. He who turns a sinner away from the error of life of his way will save a soul, save a soul from death, and cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of God. So let us pray. I welcome you to raise your hands in offering up our prayer to God, if you choose to do so or are able. Dear God, we ask you for your blessing on the members of our church, do your work through them as only you can do. Bless those of us who went to Haiti to spread your word. Keep each and every one of us in the palm of your hand as we continue to praise you and serve you in all that we do. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry Speck has been on many mission trips now. What, how many mission trips have you been on, Jerry? She has lost count. She's like uh, the, the Haitian older women that I kept asking, how old are you? Because I compare gray hair with them. And they'd say, I don't know. <laughs> That's what I'm going to start saying now. When somebody asks me how old I am, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But actually, in Haiti, you don't. You kind of, it doesn't matter what your age is, really. Um, but Jerry has been a backbone of missions here at Westchester United Methodist Church for a long, long time. She went on mission trips with Bill Peters and helped him out, and now she's kind of our Bill Peters, you know? She's pulling all the trips together, so let's have a hand for Jerry. She has a word to say. 
so it's pretty hard to follow Linda, and <laughs> especially since I'm not really prepared to talk. I was just going to come up here and wing it. So this is Wong, and um, it, it, I, I could stand here and tell you stories all day, and it would probably end in a, pi a puddle, so I'm not going to do that. But I am going to ask you, and she did a great job of um, saying how much we appreciate our congregation for sending us on these trips, because we obviously couldn't do it without you. Um, this is our third trip to Haiti. Um, we had several people that this is their second or third trip to Haiti. We had um, a lot of newcomers come this year, which was fun. We had an age range of 14 to 69, so that was new for us. Um, the last two were more just high school kids, but we had uh, members from outside of our church, three members who, um, one was a family member and two were uh, boys um, from West Town School and other schools, but that just melded right together. Um, and what you find, and, and the reason that we keep going back to Haiti is because you can't not go back to Haiti, because once you go there, see, <laughs> this is what happens. Um, um, the thing that I find when you go there is because uh, you can hear God better in Haiti. You can hear him talking to you there. Here you have a lot of distractions, you know, with, with everything that goes on here. But there you see it and you hear him talking to you. Um, something that we do in youth group is if you're talking about something that um, spiritual to you or something that's meaningful to you, um, you say God is good. And then you guys say all the time. And then I say all the time and you say God is good. I'm going to teach you some ugly Creole, which is what we learned. <laughs> My daughter Hannah came with us, and it was her second trip, and she became very good friends with um, one of the translators in one of those assembly lines, passing stuff back and forth, because basically what we do there is we aid the masons and the um, engineers to build the house. Building a house there is a huge thing, so I don't know what the house looked like before we got there, because they had already torn it down, a previous house, I assume, and built the foundation and were waiting for us to move the rocks and the cinder block for them. So we were just the grunt. Their um, mission of hope wants the Haitians to do the work. So we're providing a job for about six or seven guys there in an engineering company. And um, we basically put the rocks around the foundation and then they built it up and then we left it. Um, when we left, it was at level ready for the concrete block to go on. So. Because it's so hot in Haiti, things kind of go slower. Um, because during the middle of the day when you're working, um, it's hot. So <laughs> they you know, get a lot of work done in the, after in the morning, and uh, they just work all day. It's just crazy. Um, anyway, uh, God is good. Bon Dieu bon. That's bon Dieu bon. God is good. Bon. Um, so I'm going to say, and then you're going to say tout tan. That's all the time. Tout tan. So I say, bon dieu bon. Tout tan. Tout tan. Bon dieu bon. Thank you. So uh, the church needs to continue to be built and rebuilt again and again and again in every, late, in every generation. And um, where are you in your three steps today? begins with accepting Christ as the foundation of it all. If you don't have Christ, find him. Be found in him. The second step is having the spirit. You know, do you listen for that still small voice and go where you're sent? And finally, is once you hear that still small voice, get up and go. And it doesn't have to be a mission field in Haiti. It doesn't have to be a mission field in West Virginia or any of the American places that we go to. But your mission field might be right here. It might be taking Japanese students into your home, like we have in the front box here on our, uh, our bulletin today. It might be working with a youth group or singing in a choir. That's a mission field, too, when you're singing and sharing the love of Christ with people. Get out there in the mission field, and your faith will grow and our church will grow, and your place within the church of Jesus Christ will continue to grow. Another way our church grows is through our offering. You know, every Sunday we take it, but I think we need to be reminded again and again this is an act of celebration. It's an offering that goes to God and gets used to spread the gospel here, around the region, and around the world. So I thank you for your generous gifts. Let us praise God as we bring our offering this morning.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Generous God, giver of life, yours is the voice that calls to us, urging us to remember your presence, to listen to your wisdom. Yours are the arms that reach out to us, embracing us with your forgiveness, encircling us with your protection. Yours is the spirit that fills us, infusing us with courage and remaking us in your image. Your mission towards us never ends, and your hopes for us are beyond our deepest yearnings. Therefore, with apostles and prophets, with holy women and men of every age, with people of mission, both near and far, we join our voices to sing your praise.
from the depths of your yearnings for us. You sent your son to live amongst us in trust and love. Jesus lived your mission for him, bringing to us good news of new life and the promise of your unfailing faithfulness. On the night before he died, Jesus shared a meal with his friends. And while at table, he took the bread, gave you thanks, broke it, and shared it with them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave you thanks, and shared it with them, saying, This is my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember the gift of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection, and even today, over 200 years later, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Generous God, may this holy meal, filled with the presence of Christ, be for us sustenance for the mission you give us. In sharing of this bread and wine, may we be empowered to share the gift of the gospel. In the knowledge of Christ's giving of himself for us, may we look beyond ourselves to the needs of others. As your mission towards us never ends, so may our life be one of joyful mission to others. For you are our God, our joy, our hope, blessing and honor. Glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. We break, we break this bread to share in the mission of Christ. We who are many are called to one mission, for we all share in the one bread. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as, as we, we forgive, forgive those, those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The table of our Lord is open to all. If you're a guest or visitor here today, you need not be a member of this church. Our table is open to you. For Christ said, let everyone come who is weary, who are heavy laden, and Christ will give you rest. Christ will give you direction. Christ will give you joy. Um, we will be receiving communion today using the method of intinction, which means uh, you can receive communion in four different stations uh, on the aisle of the church. Our ushers will usher you to those stations. You'll be given a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and then partake of it. And then you're welcome to go back to your se seats and keep singing these songs of mission that we have to sing. Sing them joyfully and learn from them as we sing. You may choose to take time at the chancel rail and to receive communion at the chancel rail. Come down the outside aisles to do that and spend all the time you'd like in prayer. Like you're asking for Christ to come into your heart or for the Holy Spirit to speak to you once again or for some mission to be made clear to you. Uh, come as you feel led to do that. Um, we Stephen ask, ministers. Pardon me? Stephen ministers. And we do have Stephen ministers for you as well. If you have a special prayer need today and uh, it's something that you've prayed for alone for a while and you might need a little help praying for it. They're confidential. They'll be on the side up front here. Seek one out, and they'll pray for you and minister to your needs. Please come forward as directed by our communion ushers.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for life and love and strength and community. We thank you for your uh, being the strength beneath our feet, for being the sun that lifts up our face, for being the one that commands us to go. Be with our church, that we may be a church solidly standing on the love of Jesus Christ, a church that listens to the Spirit and feels the Spirit's winds lifting us up, and a church that goes out to share the good news with those who need it the most. Bless, heal, and strengthen us that we may be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing the first and last verses of our closing hymn, Go Make of All Disciples, number 571, first and last verses. Help us to wake up with thoughts of you, to work, play, and love with thoughts of you, and to sleep in peace with thoughts ever of you. We go from this place with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, always before us. Amen. Go in peace.